Hello everyone, today we talk about Italic warfare from the 9th to the 11th century. The warfare, in fact, of the Regnum Italicum, still known as the Regnum Langobardorum, by the way. Uh, we made already several videos about the Italic kingdom as such. Uh, mostly for medieval Italy we have covered the communal era, but right, we managed to make something, in fact, about this this period, say from Carolingian times after the, the Frankish conquest of Italy, let's say, to uh, to the rise of the communes. Just recently, I made a video about the uh, increase in you know ecclesiastical power, including the military one in the in the late, if I'm not wrong, in the Car in Carolingian times in the ninth century. I'm just looking at it now. Uh, and uh, last year we uh, dealt with um, Ottonian uh, Italy with the say the intermediate period uh, between the Carolingians and the Ottonians, the opposition to Hugues of Provence uh, as um, king of Italy from the, the various chunks of the Regnum. As a matter of fact, I also made a video about the Carolingian domination of Italy, and there is something strategic about that. Then, for this period, I also advise you um, the uh, another video known as the military significant of the consulate in the foundation of the Italian communes. This is incredibly important. We'll partly um, see it uh, still today. Here, there was also uh, one video about the power before say, in, in the Italian cities before the communes. Um, in fact, this is Vice Domini, f uh, Feudal Curia, the Conventus, the Boni Omnes, etc. In part, we will uh, look uh, at this as well. Uh, it's, it's a very important topic because, um, say, post carolingian Europe in general is not a very well-popularized topic at all um, as a continental European medievalist, of course, I have a very strong attachment uh, to the period, if anything, because they make us study it uh, ad nauseum to, to some extent, but it's objectively very important because it is these, say, largely three centuries, right, um, of uh, hardcore, like, properly center of European power uh, that get molded um, and that has also a very strong military bias in the at, at least in, in the concrete substance uh, of, of these foundations. As you know, the, the military class was founded as a sort of universal one in post carolingian territories. Exactly at this time, the rise of the militas as a truly separated uh, estate right, of, of society. But of course, every post carolingian territory has its own uh, peculiarities. And the Italic kingdom as such also passes a bit you know, in, in the foreground uh, mostly, um, but as we explained in other videos about the Italic crown, uh, most of our, in fact, if, if you go um, in the Renovatio Imperium post Carolingian history playlist, you will you will find uh, plenty of these topics, especially connected with the other two, like other three actually, you know, the, the Western, the Eastern Frankish kingdoms, and the uh, the Burgundian one, as a matter of fact. And um, there is this sense that you know. Um, Fragmentation um, is a bit the the hallmark uh, of these uh, polities, especially after the, the fall of the Carolingian Empire. But in general, right, Central Europe, um, uh, the Italian peninsula, do not really take off as strong monarchies uh, in the later period. The same Western Frankish one actually takes a long time, as you know, uh, before rising to. To, to a regional dimension in the 13th century. So this really applies a bit to the, say, the, the world feudal scenario here. But it's important to stress how actually the Italic kingdom had had a crucial role um, and centrality, uh, as well as an important functionality in the political, institutional, but also military um, system of the uh, Carolingian Empire and the later one. What gets forgotten, uh, at least again in pop culture, I, I don't think anyone has ever made a, a video on YouTube on this macroscopical historiographical event that you know you, it is, say, the late 
uh, Carolingian phase, but also the, the succession of imperial power throughout um, the, uh, the, the Frankish um, uh, conquered territories. That is, that the, the Kingdom of Italy was actually the one to which the imperial authority was associated, not just because you had to control it in order to be crowned Roman Emperor, but because literally the Carolingians began to rule from there, right? Uh, the branch that fundamentally until the, the, the 70s uh, of the 9th century rules the empire is the Italic monarchy. They are the descendants of Charlemagne. And um, the interesting aspect of this, of course, is the continuity with the Longobard kingdom that I also discussed widely. We will come back um, dealing with because uh, it, it's also underappreciated. But you see, it's an un underappreciation after another. And we skip the entire picture here the fact that the Carolingians not just chose this kingdom because of the Roman connection, but because of the incredibly efficient Longobard state that instead passes for the hyperly fr fragmented, uh, hyper and uh, hopelessly fragmented um, polity in the of in, say the ducal anarchy, all this stuff. This is a complete um, you know mirage of some sort that we know why it came out um, historiographically, but it's been debunked I think from. Uh, at least 70 years of historiography, so it's pretty curious that uh, people still, you know, do not know that it's com it's been demonstrated that it's complete reverse. Uh, the Italic Kingdom was incredibly unitary uh, in its own fashion, especially in longer times. Admittedly, the Carolingian conquest actually starts causing a bit of fragmentation, and of course, Italy follows the rest of uh, the Carolingian territories as far as further fragmentation. Um, after the, the end of... There is technically not the end of the Empire, if not the Carolingian dynasty as such, but you know what we're talking about here. Um, it, we will have to cover the same, for example, Italic emperors, right? Verona, uh, Spoleto, etc. had their own technical, uh, you know, I I Italian crowns as Holy Roman emperors, was what we, we called them uh, from later on, but here was the same exact continuity that um, had... Uh, at least being restarted in the West by Charlemagne in his Frankish but also Roman Empire. Um, and the Franks had attempted to erase the sort of, at least, Longobard title of the kingdom. That's why they start calling it Italic Kingdom. Up to this point, um, Italy as a whole, but mostly the, the, this institution that had, in fact, almost, you know, by the time of the Carolingian conquest, um, united the, the world peninsula um, was known abroad universally as Langobardia, the land of the Longobards uh, and um, there wasn't much also in terms of local uh, law that could be done to erase that, the Carolingians of course issued their own capitularies but they're incredibly attempted towards the local uh, jurisdiction they want to know how the Longobards had been administrating this system because it was very urbanized. It had a, a very, uh, you know, um, uh, evenly distributed wealth, um, which was the very opposite in, in the Frankish world. And it was literate. Like, the Longobard dukes were presiding over, you know, justice. They they, they read, they, they, they issued um, their own um, their own sentences. They had a sort of very... Mm, concentrated, say, centralized proper power in the Pavis Palatium that really represented the ultimate, you know, and the, the first as well as the ultimate point of reference legally for every subject's, um, uh, you know, uh, needs, uh, and had actually been producing a pretty orderly system that also the later Italian communes, as far as especially as Lombardy and Tuscany, that were essentially the core land of the kingdom and such, would later uh, manifest uh, in, in communal times, right? Uh, but what, we also, what also gets uh, overlooked is how much continuity existed in this regard. That's why I made that video, by the way, about, say, power before the communes, because you have to explain how th these uh, urban centers around which, essentially, the, the kingdom was organized differently from, from the other uh, Carolingian ones, was... Um, was always ruled from the city, 
right? Admittedly, again, with the Carolingians, things change slightly in the measure in which they concentrate more power in the hands of fewer people, and some of these have, uh, of course, are rural estates. But in Italy, differently from north of the Alps, basically every count, every part of the countryside had always been connected to the city. So there is a, a very, uh, you, there can be different, there is the world of the city, the world of, of the countryside, uh, but they're always united politically uh, and military, as we will see now. Uh, the other very important aspect, as you know, is that this kingdom had had the unique prestige of being coupled to the Frankish one. The kingdom of the Longobards, eventually the, known as the Italic kingdom, is paired to the Frankish one, north of the Alps, meaning that Charlemagne first, took, when conquered it, uh, equated, he, he crowned himself... Uh, king of the Longobards, as much as he was king of the Franks, and they remained in this sense separated because of the obsession towards this people that, in spite of the conquest, had prior to previous generation actually um, been allied with the Franks and had not really generated much problems in the past, especially ones of conquest. Admittedly, the Franks wanted to conquer Italy from you know, from. Uh, quite long before in the 6th century, but of course what happened in the early Middle Ages had sort of, including the fragmentation of the Frankish kingdom in, in four parts, um, had prevented this from happening, but it was not something that had forcefully to happen, especially considering the succession problems of the Carolingian dynasty. In other words, Charlemagne and Louis de Pius were fortunate that their uh, uh, brothers had died, and so they could unite power in their own uh, under their own person, and as you know, before and after that thing has started to become more difficult. But for this reason, it's even more interesting to look at the, say, Italic organization. Today we talk about warfare in general, but it's just like an introduction to the main uh, military institutions and challenges and what uh, the system was doing. Um, so there is this other uh, misconception that is the fact that the long I, mean, I talk about this in, in some videos about the Longobards is that the Longobard invasion and the subsequent Carolingian conquest would have allegedly in fact cancelled the Roman political traditions. This is true when you look at the name of the institution. Uh, this remains again the kingdom of the Longobards. It's not a Roman thing. Nobody really. The Longobards never tried to do that. The, the Franks did compromise themselves at some point, um, obtaining the vicariate, for example, of the Gauls from the Empire, etc. The Longobards had never recognized um, Roman authority, and that's also why they were sort of liked by the same Franks and other Germanic peoples because they, you know, felt differently from them. They had stayed true to their own values. In many ways, the reason why. The Carolingians had succeeded in conquering the Longobards. Uh, it's actually, a, um, uh, I have an incoming video uh, randomly on the same topic, um, so stick around if you're interested in that. Is, um, isn't, it's not really controversial per se, but of course um, it's also mm, obvious to some degree because of the different uh, Longobard military organization. Probably it's been overly, uh, overly stressed as an idea. Of course, there were major reasons why this happened specifically at that point. It was possible for the Longbirds to actually stem um, the Carolingians until the next, I don't know, accident, death of, of the monarch could have engulfed the, the situation in a, uh, again in Western Central Europe. Um, but, um, of course, this was a smaller power. It was not really like... The Franks were the exception in terms of the incredible um, military engineering that they managed to, to put together in terms of literal, um, you know, the, the development of heavier cavalry on a systemic basis on a large scale. That's also a topic, actually, that is randomly coming up next um, after the one of the longer birds, because I already know beforehand, uh, of course, and um, so we will analyze it uh, in part as well. Um, in any case, the most important aspect to realize here is that t today we stop to the communes, right, that emerge, as you know, formally from the end of the 11th century. Uh, but given the military developments of communal Italy during the 12th, 13th century, you can't uh, fail to, to see um, how 
continuous the urban power really was from literally you know roman times and how in fact the various military clientels and you know institutions and and uh, and broad organization kept developing um you know, throughout the centuries that are very you know quiet if you look at europe as as you know we, we don't get this overly abundant um documentation as you know not even in in a, in a in a country like italy um but you know that uh, for that boom after the year 1000 th there had been a lot going on especially during the 10th century um and i think for for the kingdom of italy is is quite self evident it's not just the, the communal armies that are really a cut and that is yet probably the single most overlooked um uh, chapter in medieval warfare but possibly even the single most advanced together the, the french the french armies at least but i have reasons to suspect that at some point during the 13th early 14th century Italian communal armies were really the most developed um, in europe surely this was the most belligerent country uh, of the bunch at, at the time um uh the um the 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 for example the novel uh the novel dimension right how this cities from the kingdom of like Pisa or Genoa began to, to sweep autonomously. The Western Mediterranean from Saracen presence, how they sort of consolidated their own uh, trout, making essentially Mediterranean an Italian lake. I, I made multiple videos on this topics as well. So you know that something was boiling, right, uh, in the pot. And that, you know, but you can't quite see to it unfortunately during this centuries they're a bit critical again under documented etc you do know that there is more than you can see obviously but much more than you can even imagine if, if at least you have not got gotten interested in you know historiography um admittedly there is not so much in terms of uh, military publishing on these topics but um at least on schwerpunkt i try to cover uh them in a way that can pave the way even for further further interest for the research now uh the the the, Rom the 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 issue of the roman institution is mostly this that the city had been in the roman empire but also in in longer times it's a, it's a full romano germanic tradition also because they really had it the same uh made multiple videos on this sort of imperial catholic background as the cohesive force of romano germanic europe as a matter of fact that the citizens of the cities were freemen which means that as such they had the right of bearing the cingulum militaris which meant um, theologically metaphysically that they owned the imperium as such i made multiple videos including the the one on cremona for example with the the symbol of the hand with the globe um that really you know if, if you check that video out the the anecdote regarding to that makes you realize that the militas of these italic cities were habituated to think themselves in a sort of you know uh, countering and in challenging mode against the same emperors right hence the later lombard league etc a structuralism socio-economical history has made you think that this were first of all in general after the enlightenment this were democratic modern people um and that uh they it, it was about uh you know the commoners the shoemakers that were managing to defeat the knights this is not true right the cities get ruled uninterruptedly throughout their history by a radically violent professional military elite in the form of the militas that are the ones that of course and i made a video about this are constantly aware throughout the entire middle ages of the full potential of infantry uh, even against cavalry and even more than the same infantry is believed um and that managed to coalesce this impressive military that again developed especially in the 12th and 13th early 14th century and that nobody literally nobody writes about and that uh even if you look at the Cambridge medieval warfare like you you have the single most important battles of the period crossed out right there are smaller ones uh including about the same Italy during other times of the middle ages but those ones are eclipsed nobody nobody studied them they i mean they they know that there are but nobody has 
literally written about them. Um, and it's insane because they are literally much bigger, right? They're actu actually the largest of the period. And uh, again, I've been working on that as well. As you know, I, do, I actually studied the, uh, the Holy Roman Empire. I'm just writing anecdotally right now an article about German mercenaries in early 14th century Italy, all these things. Um, but I can assure you that we will have fun in the future if I, if I hopefully continue, uh, meaning that if I survive, if I'm able to, to make videos, of course. Um, and I will also provide you with some of my publications at some point because I think uh, it's fair. Like, I don't have to, um, you know, uh, it's my own copyright. Well, technically, I have been published somewhere else, uh, aside from the open source ones, you know, I still should credit them, but I, I credit myself, for, so I don't give a damn about that uh, with my own work. Um, but it's really an important topic that begins here, like the roots are laid uh, in these centuries, right? Um, and so bear in mind that being free means to be noble in the universal tradition. The Romans, the Germans believed that, right? Otherwise, they could have not had as freemen arms, right? And you know that actually in Carolingian times, in post-Carolingian times, you have instead in Europe this gradual takeover of the elites that basically disarmed the population at large. Uh, and as such, uh, yes, technically there are, people are free in a sense, but they're not free in practice. Um, and Italy maintains actually a very high level of that liberty. I mean, Again, I made multiple videos about this too, also in the Medieval Society playlist, um, the passage from Colony to Massari in Longobard time, for example, that, that's all part of the, same, of the same story. But if you wonder where communal armies came from and why they were so performing, just realize what the mindset of these people actually was. Because if you don't get that, you can't get the rest at all. It's pure materialistic superstition, nothing else. You can't interpret it otherwise, and, and failing, of course. Um, so, when the Franks had conquered Italy, they had um, installed themselves um, in the, uh, of course, most strategic locations of this quite composite territory, right? Italy, as you know, basically any army that fought there historically has a quite... Uh, complex geography uh, it's uh, it's yes it's well defined as a peninsula but within it it's a, it's mostly mountainous it has especially uh, towards the, the the south few coastal plains it's, it's an arduous place to, to control at some point that's for example why the Franks did not man not everybody anybody actually managed to to to, to take over the entire peninsula right the Ottonians uh, before the the defeat against the Saracens, at uh, Cotrone, actually, uh, were, they were the ones who went the closest, uh, but um, not at this time. Actually, we have still former um, southern Longobard duchies that hold out. Yes, they are sort of clients, vassals even of of the Carolingians, but they, the latter never quite controlled them. So the Italic Kingdom today, we do not stop on, on the boundaries of that, but you know what what we're talking about, right? There is a, it's it's essentially central in northern Italy. There is the the, the the emerging papal states in between, but fundamentally the the, the Franks, the Teonians later also control those central Italian territories. Uh, there is Polito from, from literally the other side of, of the papal territories as well, um, and you have Corsica by the way that had been conquered by the Longobards, uh, etc. Um, so all within this and some frontier areas, for example, with the Byzantines, with the Slavs in the east, we'll see now, um, and in the south, of course, with uh, in fact, the, the other empire as well. Um, and uh, later on, the Saracens uh, made multiple videos about their invasions, etc. Um, in Italy, there is a king at this point, that he's the Carolingian one, right? It's the um, the dynasty of uh, of Lothar, right, it arrives to Louis II, uh, and as such, they rule, right? They are emperors, but also kings of the Longobards, or Italic kings. They rule from Pavia, just like the previous Longobard kings, and the um, kingdom is uh, uh, ruled um, through uh, the counts that were installed in 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 the territory, 
uh, on the basis of the Frankish model. These are mostly Franks, and they're actually some of the finest Frankish nobility that come from the very northeast of uh, um, of Paris, just the, 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 the properly the, the truest heartland of the Frankish territory. Some come also from other places, um, but um, these are men, uh, also from from marked areas like Brittany, etc., that will found very important. Uh, Italian and also later German dynasties, that in fact, uh, such as the Welfen, for example, they, they were the Est, essentially, that they, they were of Frankish origin, then they installed in themselves in Italy, and then eventually they went over to Germany as well, because still, uh, as you know, from Ottonian times, this was seen as, as a wall, right? You could, you, yes, the, the Italian kingdom existed, but at the beginning of the 11th century, the sense that um, there, there were Italic um, pretendants to the throne was obliterated, Right, there were rebellions, such as of Arduino of Ibrea, etc., against the uh, the Bavarian branch of the Ottonians after the death of Arthur III. But they are defeated. At, at best, they controlled one third of the Po Valley in the in the, in the western area, Piedmont, Lombardy, etc. Um, but eventually, the communes also take over. The, the same Germans do not make it to control the, this territory uh, directly. Then there is the investiture controversy. There's the mess that we have uh, talked about, so these centers would autonomize themselves ever further. Um, in any case, uh, the Longobards had been ruling through dukes and then gastels that were essentially representatives of the king, uh, since the dukes did not really have a dynastic profile like uh, uh, the Franks uh, had uh, developed historically with... Um, small lords, they in many ways had even more land than the same Longobard king personally, because in Italy, again, this uh, wealth was very evenly spread. Actually, it, it, there was the highest per capita wealth uh, in the world, uninterruptedly from Roman times to, to the late 17th century. And as such, the Longobards had not developed, as we were saying before, the professional military clienteles that the Franks instead relied on, because there was just one guy in his uh, retinue that were professional soldiers, and then an enormous amount of peasants working for them. In Italy, it's slightly different. At least they inst the, the Franks installed the same model, the same conquest was not particularly pleasant uh, for the Longobards, uh, but it was devoid of the excesses, at least, of, you know, uh, that the Saxons suffered. In any case, um, that so equilibrated socio-economical balance had sort of sunk in some parts. There had been, uh, let's say, Italy had been, of course, employed for uh, the, the strategic purposes and the further expansion of the Carolingians. We have seen it recently with the Pannonian Slavs. We have seen it with medi in medieval Friuli as well. So there are areas that are more or less militarized, right? There is a Byzantine coming back in the south. They also sponsor again the the, the Longobard exiles after the conquest. So the Franks are extremely careful about uh, the Italic kingdom because they fundamentally fear this to rebel at every moment. And Charlemagne, as uh, rushes, right, whenever there is a rebellion, uh, the most significant one was the one culminated at, uh, at the Battle of the Livenza River, about which I made a video in which the so-called Austrian dukes, um, so meaning the ones of northeastern Italy, because the, the Longobards had, just like the Franks, in Austria and Austrasia, right? Uh, the latter was called Austria, but not because of the modern country that is across the Alps, right, um, that came from the Ostmark and the Pannonian mark, and I made a video about uh, the Duchy of Austria, of course, if you're interested in that as well. Um, but to make the long story short, um, they, they occupy military this land, and they installed their own uh, their own counts, which are treated, they, they, they don't renounce uh, their original lifestyle, they start concentrating ever more power. Some Longobard dukes um, are maintained, in power, because again, the, the Carolingians didn't want to go to, you know, heavily um, on this land. They just await these guys to die, because it was longer tradition, just like with their kings. The only case of functional elective monarchy that, that I can think of, to just elect, in fact, um, the next ruler, rather than, even if there was some dynastic continuity, but officially, right? So, And so they, they take advantage of this by eventually installing their own Frankish um, uh, men uh, just by pushing, of course, imposing themselves. Um, and the thing is fairly smooth. I mean, Italy remains, again, the 
becomes actually in this way the center of the empire, at least as far institutionally speaking, and because the Carolingian, the major uh, Carolingian, the ruling imperial Carolingian line rules from there. Of course, the Frankish heartland, militarily speaking, remains uh, the, the the most important area from which, in fact, later also the you can see in perspective of, at the time of Charles the Bold, um, the um, you know. Um, uh, Arnulf of Carinthia, etc. Like these guys tried to retake control of Italy after, in fact, the Carolingian branch there had extinguished, and later on the Ottonians come to Italy again. But that was also because um, Rome was there, and of course, yes, this rich, fragmented region was, of course, the best prey, right? Um, so in Carolingian times, you see essentially a count in every diocese, which is also every city, right? This is the most important aspect of uh, the Italian government that, again, the Missi Dominici, right, the, the count plus the, the bishop, basically, uh, it's, it's an improper definition in this case because, you know, the, the, the local Italian churches, as we will see, would always maintain a great episcopal power in the city just from late antique times, but... That was the point. The church had some prerogatives and the counts took control of the um, advanced sort of military dimension. The, the bishops had their own clientels. They, in post carolingian times, they would develop them also in a military sense, as you will see now, so much so that the Ottonians, famously enough, would confer them with the comital rights, including the, the military ones, in a much more feudalized context. And it had begun in part at this point. Right in some uh, provinces that were more threatened, the counties were uh, regrouped in uh, larger military districts, the marches, that were in fact entrusted to a marchion. Right, uh, marchion would be the best term because marquis is, let's say, more proper to the later Middle Ages when the, the title had acquired proper nobiliar hierarchy. Right, so this marches were um, mostly on the frontier, right, and they uh, forget about Verona or Ivrea, uh, etc. Uh, not always, right, but they, they were of course more important in many ways because politically and strategically the control of the region depended on that, right, on the, the capacity of the Carolingians to fence off invasions, actually to project their armies even further. This again was particularly evident in the northeast, in part also in in, in southern Italy, um, but um, especially towards, uh, say, the Adriatic and the Slavic territories. They were at some point supported against these Carolingian forces by Constantinople. Notoriously enough, there are some islands. Literally, think about Venice. Right, uh, the siege of which uh, the the same son of of uh, Charlemagne and heir to the to the imperial throne uh, dies of malaria. Um, so Venice would remain essentially a part of the Byzantine Empire, even though they they would autonomize themselves quite uh, quite soon, like in, in still in Carolingian times in the ninth century, um, and in fact uh, interacting heavily with the same kings of Italy. Um, towards the end of the Carolingian Empire, the uh, Italic counts, albeit always remaining, as it was also technically and theoretically true for for Frankish lands, remaining function public functionaries, had, however, also become some sort of vassals. Right, the feudal dimension had increased. Right, public power began to wane, so these guys um, took matters in, in their own hand. Um, they were essentially the product of a Frankish Longobard aristocratic blend, uh, and they were securing, just like in other parts of, uh, of Europe, their own local uh, lordships, uh, and competing uh, in this very interesting kingdom for not just the local crown, but also the imperial one in Rome, as we were um, telling before. They, 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 they could exploit just because they were so close. All right. um, so 
this produced with the extinction of of the Carolingian dynasty uh, all these uh, upheavals and agitations that um, would bring de facto to to an end of the possibility of a of a unitary uh, institutional uh, profile, say for for the realm, as well as a a royal dynastic continuity. This is important to stress practically until the Ottonians, and in spite of you know significant figures like um, Charles the Bald and the Hugo of Provence, etc., there is not a, in this case, is respectable, in fact, nor a continuous, nor a, or even medium term lasting or uh, territorially complete control of the Italic kingdom the local uh, aristocracies managed to create these provincial domains that fundamentally are centered on the Mark of Verona, the one of Ivrea, uh, Spoleto, and there is also the Mark of Tuscany that is uh, rising, but they, um, they are themselves um, individually incapable of knocking each other out and so there is always a balance for which nobody really manages at any point to extend full control on one another they can be crowned they can be powerful enough to be crowned kings of italy if they control the triangle pavia milan uh monza these these were usually the, the places where the iron crown of italy was was conferred you can have even a foreign interventions like the the Burgundian one, the, the Provencal one um, later in fact it's the Ottonians that take over but in fact until the latter you do not have a full control. Doesn't matter how powerful these people actually are and great part of this has to do with the aforementioned even distribution of power that had somehow mm, let's say manage to sustain now essentially a feudal profile but not in that larger scale that was possible in larger signories in in other parts of the empire where actually uh, no sovereign at this point is able to control the entire uh, realm right so Italy in this sense is not really exceptional but the fact that these local centers of power revolve around the cities and have this more contained provincial dimension looks very much like still a sort of Longobard ducal legacy even though it's not quite the same um, but um, again the, the possibility to uh, to have a full control on the various uh, say you mean comital or marginal lineages exactly because of you see it combined both things right even distribution in longer times had meant greater governability because there weren't great concentrations of powers locally individually and so the state sort of was present the monarchy managed to work everywhere um even if it had its preferential centers of power now with the dynastization brought by the franks you have um this power essentially informally being held by different chunks that have enough resources on their own but also are contained enough not to uh, manage to prevail on one another so a very balanced uh, situation this was not really positive of course for the for the kingdom itself for example it rendered it more exposed to the second invaders especially the magyars the Saracens were mostly Italy, hitting southern Italy, but, for example, they swarmed into Piedmont. At some point, they, as you know, they crossed the Alps, they arrived in the Upper Rhine Valley, even in the Eastern Frankish Kingdom. Um, however, generally speaking, central and northern Italy are relatively immune, right? At best, the, the Saracens at some point uh, pillaged Farfa, even the, the, the basilicas of St. Peter and St. Paul, meaningful enough in Carolingian times still, by the way, so a very dark thing etc but they don't really push like it's you know just just they're just raids right um and uh more or less right this italic uh ensemble remains 
remains a thing on its own. This, I think, is very important in terms of, institu of institutional continuity, meaning that this kingdom could have fragmented at some point historically, like pick the Burgundian one. Um, uh, that also remained up to late uh, into in the Middle Ages, but it l literally had no internal um, order of some sort. Everything had exploded. Italy sort of manages to shift everything in the centers of power, and so if you look at that, you say, but it's fragmented. Yes, but it's very orderly. The cities are all pretty much alike. They evolve all with the same, uh, at the same pace. They're all organized in the same way. They have a lot of leagues going on. Right, they know how to interact with one another, so it's a completely different scenario. It's as if, and and that preserves the uniqueness of the Italic kingdom in the imperial institutions, uh, and the the kingdom goes on, right, until secularization fundamentally, in the nineteenth century. So, the this is very interesting because it. Um, uh, you know, it witnessed uh, throughout the centuries, of course, also more power compaction, etc. Um, and it sort of survived. It's a, it was sort of the same legacy of, of, of the Longobards living throughout uh, the centuries, the ages, and through the urban centers. And never mistake this for weakness in that regard. Uh, of course, at some point, like if you look at the modern age from the Italian wars, of course, the system is, is overrun. But it, say, other areas of Europe are in, in general, not that more developed or unitary, right? Uh, and uh, so fragmented, dominated up to a certain point, actually. Um, so the darkest hour, let's say, of the Italic Kingdom is between 888-915, which was just like... Uh, the rest of the Carolingian kingdoms, such a dark time, not much because the the kingdom was at any time to be overwhelmed. Uh, there were, again, Saracen, especially Magyar raids, even the Vikings hit um, in northern Italy. But there was, just like for, uh, say, Germany was hit the most, I, I would say, the Eastern Frankish kingdom literally risked some of its eastern um, duchies to to see to 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 to, to collapse actually because of the Magyar Slavic um, onslaught. But overall, uh, nobody could really sort of this you know continental uh, interland right that was just already more advanced than than, than the surroundings destabilize the local powers for how they were structuring themselves. This moment of crisis mostly happens because. Uh, uh, the same reason, basically, that had brought the same Carolingian Empire to implode, which is to, 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 to eat itself alive from the within, because, of course, it, it had overstretched, and, uh, you know, the, the, there was no other way to keep the, this, this nobility together, but with external expeditions, when those finish, these guys start carving, without control, practically, because, again, the only control was, let's raid other peoples uh, outside, their own ter their own seigniory uh, in this territory, and that's what happens in the Italic Kingdom as well. The counts and the Marcians manage to render their own office uh, hereditary, right? Not just at some point for, for for life, but in this sense, surpassing also the Longobard tradition. It's not entirely clear how it happened everywhere. I made a video about the Duchy of Spoleto for wit. That was a very important district, but even for it, we do not have the entire exact um, complete sequence of the various dukes, um, you find within the same, the same districts eventually some greater feudal uh, fragmentation at some point. Um, for the simple reason, by the way, that in virtue of the successory rules that um, were used uh, in, in longer times, Coupled with the sense that this, that the Frankish sense that this now was a fief, right? At the death of the fief holder, this was split in so many parts, as many as the male heirs actually were. Not only them, by the way, think about Matilda of Canossa, for example, uh, etc. But the, um, so in terms of concrete power, things could were very dynamic. 
um, and especially in a territorial sense, uh, in this kingdom where uh, monetization kicks in quite early, right? You have here literally people building castles just to sell them on the market. It, it's incredible. You don't find that in, in other parts of Europe in this way. That, that tells you how advanced the, the say, trade, the, the, the commerce really was. Um, and already... So, the Italians here have inherited in part what the Franks were about, right? A concept of private uh, possession that went beyond public authority. So, a privilege, uh, an immunity, right? I am the uh, heir to my father, such uh, I. Uh, it's my right to have a part, not just of my father's possessions, but also of the fief now that is seen as a private property. Right. Remember this: that the Franks have a private idea of public uh, authority. Right. In a kingdom like the Longobard one, you would have a quite clear idea what was public authority, uh, what was pertaining to the kingdom as such, and could not be usurped by others. When the Franks kick in, they inject their own view. They uninch the Longobard system to an extent that. Um, these successors began to see now pieces of public as their own personal property, right? This is um, a very important change, and it occurs especially in these generations of of anarchy of some sort. There was always an order, of course, but um, again, between invasions, wars between these provincial um, realities, everybody starts doing a bit what they want within their own uh, their own dominion. So in the first half of the 10th century, you can see, for example, two Marcians of Ivrea, because they had split the, uh, their lines. And in 1014, three or four people uh, could claim the right to the title of Marcion of Liguria. This naturally would happen also on because of successory disputes, uh, patrimonial arrangements, uh, inheritances, and so on. So everything was now not so different from other parts of Europe. Um, but comparatively, s still, this is a pretty mild level of uh, dynastization after all. Um, in any case, uh, it did correspond to an accentuated political as patrimonial fractioning, right? Um, this stemmed from the general crisis, from the invasions, from the fact that there wasn't really a, an hegemonic power capable of bringing order or unitary control, right? The kingdom existed. There was uh, a sense uh, shared by the Italic nobility uh, still in the, the right, the, their own right to elect a king, which routinely was elected, was even called from other countries or elected among uh, the same Italics. Um, but that, however, was uh, chosen uh, according to partisan, of course, calculations uh, at some point, not for him to be too powerful. You have, as usual, somebody that is called because there is a guy that is about to take over so that the guy, the other guy comes from the external but also becomes too powerful himself so they, 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 they elect another one against him etc etc you know so a bit like Italian politics so in more recent times even though every post Carolingian kingdom had severe problems of governability at this point telling the truth is paradoxical I was as I was pointing out before that these kingdoms that eventually like you know, Italy, Germany, Burgundy, it eventually would explode during the Middle Ages in terms of political, um, say, fragmentation, were at this point much more unitary in profile than the one that actually made it to the top, like in terms of unitary power and state building, that, that is France in the Middle Ages, that at this point was literally the single most engulfed and fragmented. Technically, still at this point, you could have seen, I don't know, a Burgundian state evolving at some point, here, I talk about it in the video about the Duchy of Burgundy. Um, there was a uh, an Italo Burgundian dynasty that, if you know, literally a guy had had uh, had not uh, had died with with a male hair, etc., would have changed the entire geography of the region. There would have been a 
perhaps uh, an Isolo mm, uh, Provencal Burgundian power kingdom considered that after the split of uh, the after the Treaty of Verdun uh, after Mersen etc actually Provence belonged to Italy interestingly enough uh, it was not part of um, Lotharingia uh, in the north and so the idea that there would be other boundaries at this point uh, well actually this is the moment in which th it, they're being defined right but the options had been and would remain to some important degree there right and it was not certain maybe an italic monarchy would have functionally developed had history gone in another way we don't really know that right we can't really predict that like the history is much better studied for what actually happened which is already say more satisfying and mysterious in itself than what ifs that in fact I'm not much a great fan of um, so this fractioning we, we talked about um, is cause of disputes of violence that really go on um, forever the Magyars take advantage of this political um, instability uh, and uh, the eclipse of royal power definitely does not did not help. So there is a term in Italian historiography which is called incastellamento, which is actually used in in English as well, incastellation. Uh, Italy witnesses the rise of many fortresses, especially um, after paradoxically the uh, the major uh, invasions because it does turn out that this encastellation process was not much a uh was not much due to uh reasons of defense from the external but rather when these external threats were over right actually the subjugation of the local countryside by the more affluent noblemen right um this is true also for other areas of Europe but uh let's say there were territories that were truly building castles for defense but in any case this were the minority because raids yes were many but if you look at the map that it's big right and, and they were so not so enormously frequent as one may think um you were even in some in this region's not really waking up every day thinking oh my god you know now from the the, the corner uh, you know a banking or a saracen will pop out and you know will kill me that that's not really how it happened and and so those castles were mostly for for external defense were mostly built in some uh, emergential case in impervious territories that just blocked the actual incursions and so they were not the castles dominating the most fertile populated areas uh, of the kingdom um so in italy you have some fortresses castra generically in latin built by the kings that did their own job right even when they were just provincially based and they had managed to wear the iron crown etc they did work as such right that public authority was recognized to an extent and of course um, one of its prerogatives was the construction of fortresses uh, but there were also other great allodial uh, owners that would build castra on their own as I was saying before, there is a spontaneous proliferation of these, just not even for, again, strictly uh, emergential reasons. Right? They built castles and they sold them to make money out of them. Um, the um, main uh, defense, however, was predictably constituted by the cities of the kingdom. These were massive infrastructures fortified with rings dating to, to Roman times that had been integrated with other fortifications. Um, we surely have to make a video about how complex these really were, how the Longobard defensive system had been across uh, the uh, along the Alps, and how many different uh, fortresses existed uh, in historically in these places. Like in few... Um, hundreds of uh, uh, squared kilometers you would have hundreds of fortresses this is something that we haven't quite 
conceptualized because essentially we, when we think about medieval castles we think about the, the 12th 13th century onwards right so when stone was starting being used on a more regular basis in the italic kingdom actually there were much more um uh you know, the, the stone was much more used than in other places from earlier times. But hey, we think about those are medieval castles, right? So this kind of single isolated massive fortress is somewhere. But actually, the majority of fortresses was this immense, like, they, they would literally change the landscape. Amount of smaller castra um, that were connected with one another in an incredibly thick net and that also, again, in pop culture has been completely removed from our understanding that we're part also of regional policies right this is not a little modern baby castle but the little lord really uh, autarkically lives there and in this time that is so dark and foggy nobody knows what happens here we're talking about major regional strategies by some of the wealthiest and more powerful um, nobiliar dynasties in Europe that manage an immense amount of patrimony and that play again with the, the Italic crown, imperial one, that they are in contact with Germany, with the Byzantine Empire. That's the scale that you should uh, be thinking. And of course it is more modest than in the later centuries, but it's not because um, the, uh, the range was not basically a, a similar in scale. Uh, and um, the cities, again, are the, the main bulwarks here, the cornerstones of, of provincial rule, um, to say the least, right? Um, cities are more numerous in Italy than in the other lands of the West. Uh, and for this reason, the Italic kings began to attribute to the local bishops that were, again, quite historically powerful, um, and especially now, because they literally administer the cities, uh, literally, you know, provi provisioning the garrisons, the, the watches, etc. The protection, in fact, of the population known as tuizio, right? Um, they would essentially be granted by the monarch the right to organize these uh, military forces locally, mainly for the city defense, and in the sense, playing politically with them with uh, royal policy, uh, etc., right? Uh, all the, again, the the sense, especially in the north, the, in the Po Valley, that the cities were all part of a same group, of a same country, provincial dimension, w was felt, right? The, the early uh, league organizations, uh, these cities, you see, are very proud about themselves. They have a very strong municipal mindset, but they in parallel see themselves as part of the Italic kingdom. They feel themselves as Longbergs. They um, they are cooperating in the policies, for example, of you know um, of, of royal scope. For for example, calling a foreign king or electing a local one. So don't confuse this city base. Uh, for some sort of smaller power that that wasn't quite the case um, the um, other phenomenon that was occurring at this point is that the city was so powerful and it had uh, start rising again um, in these times after all in spite of all the, the invasions etc that the Frankish formula of the count ruling from a rural set of, of fortresses etc sort of starts to decline right in all of this and throughout the, the following centuries within the holy roman um, empire etc all the say historical comital ducal marginal powers were recognized feudally within the empire there are also very big dynasties as we were recalling before um, the uh, Germanic emperors install some of their uh, their uh, their men in, in positions of power, not just as um, counts but also as bishops. Um, and and so this feudal dimension lives on in Italy. It's also wrong, in fact, to think that the communes basically ousted the feudal dimension. That was not it, right? It was not a class struggle. It was not a social, cultural. 
um, protest. It was not a, a national position, say to the Germans, whatever. It was literally just the city, including the, in fact, all the knights that start living there, um, and that are technically the ones that create the commune with the consular regime. And, you know, they, they, they were militas on their own. It just basically moved from the countryside into the city. But still, many areas of the countryside were feudal and coexisting with the city and superimposing with that because their prerogatives, especially in this highly, again, monetized and sort of economically dynamic reality, are not about, you know, have this piece of land and then here it ends and your power starts. It's all about, I don't know, we share, for example, power in this territory. I get uh, revenues from the mills, you get it from this town. Uh, we can exchange that, we can buy this castle here. We can do and you have, um, of course, uh, this happens everywhere in Europe, but the superimposition of the urban and the feudal dimension, the public, if you want, and the feudal dimension, is, is fascinating um, in Italy. Because the city remains the cornerstone of the the dominations um, that in fact are also ruled by by some uh, cows because as we we have seen technically every diocese you read every city had a bishop but also a count you couldn't be a bishop ruling without a count unless as it happened in Ottonian times the bishops were provided with comital authority on the district which also happened but still, right in the district, you have these vassals of the emperor that last for a very long time. We'll have to make videos about these dynasties. Some remaining very loyal to the emperors for a long time. You've seen it in the videos about the Duchy of Spoleto. Um, there is the, the Marquisate of Montferrat, for example, who remained very loyal up to Swabian times. Uh, and that lived on, historically. It did not disappear, right, until... Uh, centuries later um, and this dynasty is in part united also with the patrician ones that emerged later from the regional states started from the cities and so on so this remains always a loyal land of the empire right local subjects recognize imperial authority feudal hierarchy just they, they developed their own autonomies their own prerogatives they built up the, the system of communal um, government and they wanted of course to maintain that by customary law even defending it in arms because remember that in this region of Europe people are traditionally free this is not the case in France this is not the case in Germany right there most people are somebody else's people right these cities do not have that development they cannot rule outside the city walls right here things would change and uh, in part because the same feudal aristocracy urbanizes and sort of cuts ties in part with the same that same feudal background and constitutes just a, a military class in itself that controls the cities and rules from there and develops eventually uh, states from there. Um, this is the deep difference with other parts of of, of Europe and pretty much I, th this doesn't happen anywhere in the world that I'm aware of there is no even remotely a thing of this kind other cities in the world out there would could have substantial autonomy could even be some states in their own but they were all, always affected by external lordships they were uh, eventually just part of greater powers this this ones were truly habituated to reason like they were de facto independent not ideologically but practically like by uh, by lifestyle right um, as a consequence um, the bishops initially because the city was ruled by the bishop at this point when they are conferred comital power the bishop is the first authority that sort of pushes a bit this comital authority uh, I mean the authority of those of this feudal element away from the city as well um, there's also a crisis, right? Literally, the, the countryside, as we said before, is dependent on the city in this region. Um, so there is literally an economic crisis where the city starts being the, the most profitable place to invest in. And so many of many, many vassals 
from the countryside start living in the city. Right? They have, of course, estates outside of that, but those are connected uh, to the city government as well. Um, during the 10th century, thus the bishops initially inserted gradually themselves within the feudal system because the latter was still, as we've said, n nominally standing. So some bishoprics became also true and proper seigneuries. I made a video about Asti and Aquileia, for example. There are these three um, episcopates of Istria that was very frontier area, again, between the Slavs, the, the Byzantines, and in fact the Italic kingdom. So the bishops of Trieste, Paul and Parenzo are true lords in their own regard. These, these areas were also less urbanized, so th these guys looked more like, I don't know, the in the Eastern Frankish realm, let's say, as true and proper lords on their own, more feudal in nature. You have the Patriarchate of Aquileia that, again, has an extraordinary power. It, it, it lasts literally as a feudal ecclesiastical state uh, very late uh, in, into the late Middle Ages before the Venetians take over. I made a video, if you check out Medieval Friuli, that, that is explained consistently. Part of the reason uh, why this uh, northeastern uh, Italian territories are provided with this power so is that, of course, the bishops locally were the most powerful lords, but also because these were frontier areas, so they're exposed to external threats, and the emperors needed, uh, but also the, the Italic kings for these um, this areas to be better protected by some more concentrated power like these bishops could provide. Um, so this sort of feudalization of the high clergy um, was accentuated further uh, during the time of the Ottonians. That uh, truly opened another era in Italic history, not just because the kingdom was sort of reunited to the destinies of this essentially successor Frankish power. So what we see as the Holy Roman Empire is fundamentally Italy, Germany, Burgundy, Bohemia, right? But most importantly, Italy and Germany. Um, because of this, the imperial connection, like, uh, not even Germany had the imperial title per se. They, they, the emperors had to prove to have that by coming to Rome, and so controlling all the cities that were between that and Germany, which was the actual challenge there. And so why do the, the, the bishops at this point get feudalized ever more? It's obvious, because the Ottonian army uh, um, necessitated of their loyalty to get across the uh, Italian territory. They had to pass the Alps, they had to pass the Po River, they had to pass the Apennine before getting to Rome. Um, all the major uh, arteries of communication for Roman times co connected this string of cities that were, as we've seen, heavily fortified. So the idea was to oust, um, to actually, even if the Ottonians were the emperors, to actually oust the feudal hierarchy, at least the lay one, that claimed, especially inheritance, right, a dynastic uh, prerogative on these possessions, and they would confer comital authority to the bishops that could be profitably removed because they couldn't inherit, uh, you know, they, they were, the bishop is elected by local church, right, some had children, and there was nepotism and all this stuff, but technically, like, at that point, the emperor, there was also king of Italy, of course, could simply, uh, you know, put on there whoever he wanted, Right, these guys were uh, exchangeable, but um, in many ways, what this practically turned into is that the local bishops that came, by the way, also from the local Italic families, not just the, you know, there, there was a significant injection of Germans at this point, but still they married into one another. Right, that's how it worked. Also, because the Ottonians used lay, uh, you know individuals as well. I mean, their, their military retinues, their, I mean, their armies, and their, they had to control the territory, etc. But the bishops had acquired, uh, during the eclipse of imperial power, so much power themselves that the best way just to float over this enormous system uh, stretching from northern Europe to Mediterranean was to just essentially 
confer more autonomy to the bishops so that these would be incentivized to recognize imperial, the imperial authority recognizing that and um, uh, avoiding the very dangerous dynastization of local power that in Germany instead were, had reached a level of paroxysm. Right, in Germ Germany was that sense uh, complete. I mean, even the bishops there were, of course, even more dynastic in, in so many ways. Um, and so, naturally, the Ottonians understood the unspeakable potential of an Italian rule. Of course, they wanted to rule from Rome. That's the reason, in the first place, why they 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 reached it uh, not just to get the crowd but to recreate literally the roman empire hopefully this is what later everybody would do i mean charlemagne had wanted to do that that the orange staff and we wanted to do that everybody uh, always wanted to do the same thing obviously enough because of the macroscopical self-evident uh, advantage that this would procure especially considering again the, the levels of you know of public culture in the, uh, north of the Alps that were quasi non-existent practically. So this land seemed much more organized, um, say, um, and uh, administratively efficient, etc. If it wasn't for the fact that the locals were so were starting to be so rich and powerful themselves that it was extremely complicated, especially when I don't know you had the Byzantines uh, blowing on embers of revolt and etc. That um, on the long run, also the Ottonians do not manage to handle the system. They go pretty close to, again, even kick out the Byzantines and the Saracens out of southern Italy, but there are also military defeats. And so, uh, on the longer run, the same Otto III that told them himself like, to be under a Roman emperor living on the Palatine with his court, etc., is obliged to, to dislodge because the, the local nobility was was of course very angry uh, especially at the bishop comital policy right they the, the roman barons saw the pa the papacy as a thing on the road you couldn't quite step in there after centuries of management of papal elections from the local nobility um, and simply appointing the pope that you wanted that's also where actually the germs of the gregorian reforms came from paradoxically the same ottonian imperial propaganda that eventually was the one attacked by the popes, that was the one of purification of the church. So the Ottonians had presented themselves as those that would actually choose as emperors the best guys to be uh, popes and, uh, and, um, and bishops. If it wasn't for the fact that the same church locally started to express some perplexities when, of course, this went towards the uh, direction of a... Uh, increasingly uh, centralized power that was not leaving much room for maneuver even for the patrimonium sancti pantry um, so again lots of stuff um, as you understand um, so the saxon emperors chose essentially the bishops that were faithful among them there were always two parties basically in italy you would have some bishops also going against of course the emperors um, and uh, generally speaking, the the emperors went against the main prerogatives of the lay aristocracy, uh, and um, as such, the the tensions uh, arose. Otto the first conferred comital powers on the cities within the uh, range of three or four miles around the. Uh, uh, the, the bishoprics of Parma, Asti, and Reggio in Emilia to, to the respective bishops. Otto II acted in the same way with Lodi, Acqui, and Tortona. And this was finally uh, the case for Otto III himself in favor of the bishoprics of Piacenza, Ceneda, Ravenna, and Brescia. What you want to notice about this is yes, they, they're pretty complete in various different areas, Piedmont, um, Lombardy, Emilia, um, but the, uh, the, the purpose of this was to buy essentially these bishoprics uh, to the imperial codes in order to have smoothly the imperial armies, the, the, the Germanic armies crossing into Italy without problems. Remember that this city is controlled 
the passage on the Paul River. They were all fortified. So if something had gone wrong, as it would keep going on, going wrong actually, in the in the following centuries, you could literally have to change um, alpine passes to cross, to make a much longer tours, to, to waste much more resources, um, and all this was attempted to be to be avoided. And of course, there was a lot of cooptation in the process. So that towards the year 1000, so basically at the death of Otto III, and then, yes, there is the rise of Arduin of Ivrea against um, Henry II uh, that gets put down, etc. But if we were to, to make sort of a broader picture, we can have this. Like the Marchians and the Counts possessed basically just a minority of cities. Um, and not the least important ones. For example, Milan and Pavia, that were basically the centers of, um, of the same Lombard uh, kingdom as such. Uh, Turin, Mantua, Verona, Treviso, these were all, again, all in northern Italy. And still, and there are, the, in fact, some of, of the most um, dynamic historically as well. Some of these locations are incredible for the passage of some important waterways uh, and are just very, very powerful. And you see that in here, actually, uh, lay authority maintains control. I mean, Pavia is the literal capital of, of, of the Italic kingdom. Milan is the most important city. Here, the, the local militas, the counts, the markings, have managed overall to maintain control, which means that um, together with the church and the people, still the, the militas were the, he the heavier component. We have seen how the allegiance could vary uh, very much. Uh, I just recently made uh, a video about the Pateria. We, we observed the events of Erlenbald, for example, the, the fact that, of course, there was already a sort of proto welfism and Ghibellinism um, among all these groups. So it's just not just an, an, an horizontal or vertical division. Everything is changing depending on which kind of uh, situation is, is being formed, what um, the bishops say and do, uh, what the papacy also start you know, acquiring really. At, at this point, under Sylvester II and Aurillac, you start seeing the Church of Rome really acquiring a, a fully universal image. Ide ideologically, this is also the moment in which, say, that the, the Hungarians, the Poles, are won over to, to the Roman papacy, that the empire holds a bigger role, but uh, as we have seen uh, with, in the history of Germany, also in recent videos, uh, Germany would have a great problem in centralizing and would ultimately even fail uh, to become a national monarchy. So, um, the local cities were also heading in the following generations now towards that communal direction, managed in fact by the same military class, the laymen, right? Independently from their original communal marginal authority, the communes are not under, um, in this sense, like they're not as individual communes, the expression of a count or a marginal, right? They can't be within some of this historical territories. Uh, we just made a video uh, some week ago about Ascoli, for example, who is part of the Duchy of Spoleto. But even there, the, these feudal districts are losing steam. Right? In some areas, this, they're still active, but especially in the, in the most urbanized areas, you see that, again, the, the minute has just passed to this new dimension politically and socially. Um, in other places, uh, in fact, in most places, uh, counts, uh, markings, etc., had basically been ousted politically from the from the city. Uh, given that the bishops mostly had eaten up their prerogatives, acquiring the same comital control best out upon them by the same emperors, and this would remain. Right, even if imp the imperial authority would eclipse itself uh, multiple times, even for generations, um, it's evident that um, the count uh, doesn't, uh, in that the bishops have taken over the, the comital prerogatives, and that the same communes, in fact, would develop as the strictual 
um, entities by acting on behalf of the bishops, right? They were smart because technically the commune was a complete invention. Nobody had ever really developed it um, in, in that way. And uh, But to make things uh, sort of uh, passable, right, acceptable for within the feudal hierarchy, these communes thought well to say that they were just acting on behalf of those who had maintained the feudal uh, authority, right? So if uh, they, the commune was acting on behalf of episcopal power, it could e essentially exercise the, the comital one uh, in a very uh, also intimidatory way towards the same bishop in many ways. Uh, but bishops really do maintain an important role uh, within the communes as not as leaders but still as people of, of great uh, weight and also in, during the times of the guelph ghibelline struggle they they took sides etc but m mostly it's it's the commune that rules uh there is no doubt about this in all this of course we have been talking about major political institutional figures but what about the average uh Italic Milas at this point, what was his status? How was he socially, you know, um, you know, established? Um, of course, uh, as we've seen, Italy had undergone a further feudalization. The Franks had injected it in the system, and the political crisis followed to the uh, to the extinction of the Carolingians had enhanced this. Right, so there were lots now of. Um, Knights de facto, that uh, was not something you would habitually see, say, in Longobard times. Uh, Europe had been developing through this crisis, this military classes we've seen exactly in these centuries. Um, and so the same Italian landscape had changed. Um, the militas lived mainly within a rocca or in a castello within the countryside. Right, so it's the rock castle. That's the same term. Um, their militarization is evident. Right, they lived into fortified um, uh, uh, structures and they buildings, and they were hosting a masnata of militas, constituted their retinues. In other words, you have the senior, that is the the lord, and uh, the vassals, or these other again. There are different terms um, used, right, Gregari, etc., that are under him. The, the masnata is uh, a famous term that appears, especially in the high middle ages. Uh, the etymology is uncertain. Some people think that it's the equivalent of the bucellari of the late Roman times, that is to say, with uh, machinata, which stands for, let's say, grinded, um, let's say, millet, like the, what was actually... Uh, given to cook bread um, as a form of maintenance of these guys in the in the senior household, a bit like the Huskarls, right? Uh, these guys that literally leave, sleep within the castle together with the senior as his bodyguard, and with whom they really go around uh, living their mobster's life. Um, extreme violence, extreme sense of themselves. Again, this is the, the norm, right, of, of a 10th, 11th century um, feudal context. Um, and uh, the more the system expands, the more these guys would be rewarded with uh, larger properties, assets, that are given in fief, basically, uh, as vassals. Some of them would autonomize themselves. So there is all the progression that you would imagine um, happening also socially over uh, over the centuries as, as also wealth more wealth was kicking in again more social certification was defining better the roles there were people who had began this uh, from very humble origins again it, it's literally the, the, the typical medieval knight has been just formed in a narrow sense and so um, some of these people had emerged as literally serfs of some, I don't know, Frankish count. And gradually they had, like their, their children had kept serving the, the, the descendants of the same lord. They had been entrusted with, with a castrum, and maybe the, the lord had died, and so they had remained with this castrum. They, they were becoming lords themselves under somebody else's clientele, but still with higher level. For example, I don't know, the, fame, 
This recurs even in, in the Italian onomastics of the great aristocrats. Uh, Visconti is a term, for example, that stands for uh, vice commis, which was a typical term exactly for these guys that were on behalf of the count in a castle, say, and, 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 and as such they would remain, uh, because, say, maybe the, the, the lord died or something happened, or they were actually conferred with a permanent title there. Um, and so you have even some of the most important um, European nobility layer literally emerging from this humble background. So that not, doesn't mean that all these people emerge from particularly humble backgrounds. There were ups and downs uh, throughout various dynasties in Europe, also some of the most famous. Uh, Savoy, for example, is one of the oldest and most prestigious. Uh, the Habsburgs also had uh, uh, Romano-Burgundian origin, and but they sort of went down and eventually rose up uh, during the interregnum even for very random reasons. Um, so this f franco Longobard lineages uh, here have quite interesting connections with one another. We could study them in, in depth in some other video. However, as we have just seen, the Militas were gravitating one and another around the cities, were not living there. Uh, themselves. There were also many rural communes, that is to say some villages that were organizing themselves, at least uh, the commune is a later phenomenon, but they, they were sort of emerging, right? Some towns would develop from this way as well. Um, and these communities would provide with local militia, mostly known as the peditas, generically because they were foot soldiers, um, but there are also more less uh, technical terms uh, in terms of arms like omines for example simply men or habitatores so the local inhabitants and some of these could also provide with cavalry of some sort but of course they were mostly um, footmen and they they went uh, into battle after like under uh, and next to the the militas on horseback right and these guys um, were all framed within the older Romano-Germanic concept for which, in theory, again, the, the king, uh, so the public authority was hegemonic, and so every single able-bodied uh, man had to go fighting, all right? And so there was this term of defensio patria, so the defense of, of, of the fatherland that was is to be found in Italic charters, etc., for which these troops as local levies had to, it could be summoned, right, uh, to, to, to serve uh, in the expeditions within the confines of their province, right, so the, the, all this was negotiated to some extent, but of course the militias mostly took care of, you know, of the organization, of logistics, all, and the direction just of the operations. Um, the bishops, instead, that the king's emperors had invested with the pastoral and the ring, which would be in fact quite an object of content during the investiture controversy, ruled, as we've seen, properly as lords of the cities. And as such, they also had their own military retinue, right? Um, they had also their administrative one, we've seen it just recently talking about the revival of Roman law, right, all the, let's say, the intelligentsia of the Italian communes had historically emerged from the, you know, the, 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 the Episcopal administrator, the, the school of the local, of the cathedral chapter, the, just the, the lawyers, the, also the, the craftsmen that worked for the bishops in so many ways, and also for its military, right, for his military. Um, that was constituted, in fact, uh, in this way. Uh, first of all, at the top, you had the direct vassals, right? The bishop, again, is a count, so he has control on the vassals of his districts slash diocese that overlapped, right? And these were the same districts that existed since Roman times, when the Romans founded Roman colonies. They gave this pretty, as you know, uh, precise sort of boundary. Of course, this had slightly changed, it would keep changing over time, in feudal times, especially because you had different patrimonial possessions ending up to overlap, to extend, to to modify the, the district. Uh, but more or less, right, they are the same. There are some islands, again, of 
vassals that are not really bent to the bishops and so they they are preserved over time um but mostly again they owe uh by uh, by public law that their service to to the bishop hence the city right you have this direct vassals known in latin as primi militas which means the first the first soldiers first knights right they these are the like the top like these are really the uh the top guys uh they are the most powerful individuals they are also as a consequence the best soldiers they have robust military clientels um then you have um sometimes in parallel with them because they could be still great lords um on their own but in this sense as not really tied um to uh, a specific vassalatic um mansion right being under somebody else such as the primi milites or maybe even under the same bishops but with a particular individual connection uh, at the personum there are the milites maiores so the the bigger the more important milites um and you do find uh, interestingly enough in this is typical of italy some legal procurators among them meaning that the knights were seen uh, and, uh, and just because of their power they were invested as we've seen uh, just like the longobard dukes into the local juridical uh, judicial procedures right they were literate in some cases so very rare um in europe at this time they took care of the administrative matters they controlled the communities really and so these are the guys you can really rely on these are real um feudal knights except they live in the city and or are in the service of the city all right then you have the uh vice domini as we were saying before so these are guys that are also essentially milites but they uh they are acting on behalf of this bigger ones all right then you have the captains of the people or of the gates this is typical also in the co- later communal uh organization that as you see was not a new um these were some actual militas themselves that were at the head of the uh of the city militias corresponding to the various sections of the of the city like one uh, each the, the each one had a place in front of the gate from which they had to come out also for the expeditions and so on uh there were some rota systems there was all a political gaming connected with you know who does have to serve in which part of of the district because there were different let's say the, the assets were distributed in a different way naturally the majority of the possession of 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 the people who live next to a gate were just outside in the, the, the part of the district of side that side um of of the of the city walls um so the interesting aspect about this captains is that capitane is that they are actual militas that are in charge of this local militias um the term militia of course has i i use it in english sense meaning that it means mostly levies right but milas and militas and militia in, in this context refers to the to the military class of the professional the knights the mounted warriors um which means that this captains had been just controlling a bit this realities there were militas that were in charge of the control of these people's military organization and of course because they had all the professional competence to arm them to line them up to equip them to to like they had all the, res- the responsibility it was a sort of business on their own because these guys ran in part also the local i don't know uh, they depended on the local wealth of the local shops and craftsmen and so on. then you had the militas minores or secundi militas so the lesser militas or the latter the, the second ones um that were vassals of the bishop in a second rank uh so the vavassores as they were called so not the vassi but the vavassores um and in this sense in third rank for the kingdom of italy 
And in fact, this was the title Bavassini. This is interesting, isn't it? Because uh, that's the hierarchy. You have the King of Italy, above him the Emperor, if there is one at the moment. Uh, then you have these bishops, there are counts. This is the interesting thing. Yes, there are Marcians as well that can't rule over other counts. So you can account that, right? You can't. You have even duchies, but it depends uh, here. Uh, also, how, th there is not a fixed hierarchy really yet. Uh, dukes, counts, Marcians, especially in the 10th century, change often. Say, well, also in the 9th, uh, they're sometimes recorded as counts, sometimes dukes, depending on what kind of missions they had originally. Then eventually the thing territorializes hierarchically so that you know better what we're talking about, but they could, it could be different. Then you had the major you have the Vassi, there are major knights, then you have the the second knights, um, and uh, there are the Vavasaurus. And, uh, and, and so th there are, technically for the uh, king of Italy, the Vavasi. So as the count could use the resources of the local levies, the bishop, in case of necessity, asked to all citizens to participate to the defense of the city. Right, so the bishop, again, could be a, a count by authority in practice, but originally, at least, the uh, the way uh, uh, it worked was that the count, the, the, the count was to call all these various uh, armed retinues of his own, uh, originally as the Franks that had settled as conquerors, but locally there were some Longobards, in fact they were armed as well, and so they, they would partly join these um, expeditions as cavalrymen, we know of some picked troops of Longobard uh, warriors who were sent over, like in other parts of the empire, it was normal, like you know, the Carolingian armies were multi-ethnic in many ways, and they were even quite uh, appreciated um, qualitatively uh, and uh, the bishop was fundamentally seen as a bit of a father of the local cities, and as such, um, the citizens were to be mobilized by him, right? Because the Franks did not know something like that; they didn't have that in in France. Um, so wh when wh when they conquered the Longobard kingdom, they they see that there are these city militias that recurred, in fact, also in Longobard military history that were very autonomous, like in, in terms of individual liberty, in a way that the Franks had never conceived. Probably they, they saw this, this, this as a very curious world, it's something that the Germanic emperors were impressed by uh, also in, in later times, because there could be, especially at the time, no such thing like a commune of, of, of people that were not within the hierarchy, the, the, the feudally recognized hierarchy, basically ruling over noblemen in the countryside as well, even though some of them were more powerful even than them individually, because um, basically the commune's military service was based on census, right, and they had their hell of cavalry as we've seen. Um, so the bishop, the, say the, the citizenry was seen at least as far as they couldn't really uh, fight as Militas, as deputed mostly to the defense of the city. They could also serve outside of it, but under, say, the royal banner, the, the, the local ducal marginal uh, expeditions. Um, but mostly, of course, we're talking again the 9th to 10th centuries, the, the, the resources are not infinite, right? You want to appreciate Louis II for his very tidy expeditions to, t uh, to southern Italy against. Uh, uh, the Saracens was even successful, showing that still in the second half of the ninth century, the Italic uh, royal administration did really work, militarily speaking, uh, to to mount up uh, expeditions of regional uh, reach. Right, so uh, you want to appreciate again how much had been salvaged also from all these city centers in terms of capacity of supplying 
armies, heavy cavalry, like the, the, the Carolingian one was ever more structurally basing its armies on, uh, etc. So that's why it, it's also fascinating. Um, and you find, still at the beginning of the 11th century, when also the, the citizenry is regaining steam and power, military power, the Archbishop of Milan, Aribert, summoning, in Latin, quote, Omnes Ambrosiane parochie incolas armis instructos a rustico usque ad militem, ab inope usque ad dividem. This is a beautiful phrase. It basically says it was a universal mobilization. Um, because it says basically all, I mean, those who were summoned were all the inhabitants of the Ambrosian parish, which basically means. Uh, all the inhabitants of the, uh, the, the the diocese of Milan, right, the, named after Saint Ambrose, which was also a pretty big. Um, here, parish is of course a saying, a, a humble way of at, of addressing actually a, a, a very powerful place. Uh, here, Milan had a re- significant manpower to say the least. Um, armis instructos, incolas armis instructos. So of course, all those who have been uh, were ready to to bear arms as they have been trained, etc. Um, from the rustic to the miles to the knight, from the poor to the rich, right? So everyone with their own means they had to participate. And this had been already the uh, the case, you know. Again, I, I have settled this bit about the 8th century uh, Longobard army, which in a sense fits this video because it's just the, the century before the 9th. Um, and it talks, I already talked about it, telling you the truth, but it's about um, high still flows of recruitment that are basically the explicit um, criterion of Longobard recruitment based on census as you know the romano germanic um recruitment system it was pretty universal right there are some classes of recruitment based on wealth and you had to go out war equipped in a certain way or with a horse for the most affluent um with a, your panoply uh, on the basis of that and so of course here it was had been always the same system Right. We wish we knew more from these times, because, again, they're not particularly documented, but we sort of have an idea of what this would have looked like. Right? We do have, from the art I also uploaded here in the pictures, an idea of what these guys looked like. Um, so, in theory, all this worked within the... Uh, the the will like the, the the authority of the Italic king, right? Nobody ever ceased to think that it was a king of Italy, even when it was not elected, uh, and even when it was elected but came back to Germany, for example. Um, everybody was okay with this. The cities felt proudly, as they had done since ever Roman Longobard times, as part of the system. And they knew each other, and they had an idea of what was going on in Europe, and they were actively participating, heavily actually, participating into that from a political point of view. Um, so the the union of all these forces was deemed as forming the so-called militia regni. So the idea that all the militas of of the of the kingdom and all the retinues, all the people who were to serve alongside them in this rigid, hierarchical, traditional, imperial mentality, um, were part of the Italic army. And yet, of course, this unitary reality was not to manifest itself literally on the field, because um, from the player uh, or ecclesiastical feudality, the Italic uh, royal authority, whenever there was one, would receive very, you know, uh, let's say, uh, ad hoc uh, support, military forces, depending on extremely variable political circumstances. 
So, of course, the problem was mostly the fact there was no hegemonic force capable of bringing this region down. Nor from the internal, nor from the external. And this is, again, incredibly important because at this point in Europe you hardly have any power that is capable of doing something like this. They all have their problem. But as you know, Italian history, and especially the one of the Italic Kingdom, would remain the one of remarkable autonomy, not based on a scarce development, on the contrary, right? That's why the, all the wars of Lombard League and so on, they're not small things, they're not, say, accidents, they're not so strange, I don't know, one city decided to oppose the emperor's uh, one episode. Now, this is a syst heavily systemic dynamic that um, the local cities, especially through their uh, their leagues, are that are reminiscent of that unitary Italic slash Longobard royal public past, right? Um, they uh, base themselves on. And uh, this, I think, is the most important aspect of the war. Right? The fact that differently from other kingdoms where, after all, the monarchy would remain an option, Still, technically, the Italic Kingdom remained even more compact than, say, for example, just I made three videos in a row about princely Germany. Those were 300 states. The Italians were 30, um, and were, in this sense, much more governable, but still, by granting that autonomy, than some parts of Germany that were not even reached by imperial authority. Um, and the reason being, of course, is that the the same emperors were very heavily interested in Italian politics. The, in itself, they required it to support their universal ambitions. They had, again, Guelph's Gimbelines, uh, say, uh, competing with one another and um, proxied, let's say. Uh, but uh, I made lots of videos about Italian communes, and of course, YouTube has only some uh, topics. Uh, that uh, ethnic, tribal in nature that pays more than others, so they, they don't show you the actual serious things um, of history. They just want you to, to be dumber, not to understand these pillars of Western civilization, because, hey, you know, you've never known anything of this, nobody has ever told you ever in your life. Keep not knowing that, right? What, what will may ever happen? Except, you know, the entire Western identity collapsing just because of cultural illiteracy. Uh, and the rest of the world, of course, doesn't have any trace of that. But we do not, of course, deserve to fall to those standards uh, or lack thereof. So I, I think that when we make these videos, I think it would be very, very, very useful if everybody shared them as much as it can because there's literally a counter force that prevents the world from knowing about the stuff, right? And it's wanted, right? It's on purpose. Um, in any case, you you find this is not uh, this video is not going in the Italian communes playlist. Let's say in the medieval Italy one I have here also. What is this Italic Kingdom? Do I have it? No, but I have Kingdom of Italy one. Yes. Yeah, and even a lot of videos. And how many views for this playlist? I think very few, unfortunately. Um, because nobody knows. Um, somebody. But this is about the view. I don't know where you get the views, the playlist views. I mean, I, I see it every day, really, but I I don't know. But surely it's it's not a very high number, I suspect, because yeah, whatever. It's not so important. But just for saying that, really, I I've been noticing this. That there are some topics that YouTube does not. It's not that people do not watch, but YouTube pays less um, for the ads, so it's in the algorithm showed less. 
this is how you think that you're searching for stuff. You're, you're instead played on by this infamous machine, unfortunately. And so if you really care about this channel, share as much as you can because that's the only thing that really matters. Um, for today, however, I stop it here. We'll obviously talk, keep talking about similar topics hopefully soon. Uh, for today, I uh, just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.